So if I think about an A&E job, you can't get a Venflon in, your colleague steps in and does it for you, or um, you need to swap a shift in order to go to your friend's <laughs> wedding and they step in and they help you. So I hope that he's doing that. But also, as trainees, do not underestimate the power of giving positive feedback to your seniors. That has a massive impact on us and our well-being and our motivation and encourage us to go on and being a good trainer. So talking about gratitude in the workplace is not a one-way street, it's definitely a team game. So gratitude can also be cathartic. If you think about relatives coming to say thank you to you for looking after the patient, they're probably doing that without realising to help relieve and release strong emotions that they have. <coughs> Also, gratitude encourages a culture of reciprocity, a pay-it-forward type approach. So if I go and do something nice for you, it's much more likely that you're going to go hmm, and go forward and do that for somebody else. So again, very quickly, in your departments, it only takes a couple of people to start using gratitude and you get a snowball effect. And before you know it, you can create a greater social circle of good. I just want you to have a think, when was the last time that you received meaningful gratitude? So someone said thank you to you and it touched or inspired you. So I'm going to give you a personal example because it starts to introduce the concept of why is gratitude different to thanks. So as you've heard, I'm a pre-hospital consultant. I've been doing it for 20 years. I've been on the executive board for the Faculty of Pre-Hospital Care and I've been a training programme director in FEM in the West Midlands. So it wasn't surprising that I got an email from a female consultant working in another part of the country to get advice on working when you're pregnant in the pre-hospital environment, because being honest, not many people have done it, and I had. So of course, I offered some practical advice and some sort of legal stuff and, you know, all of the rules and regulations, of which there were not many, and obviously wished her well. And she replied and said, thank you for the advice, that's great, it's really helpful. And of course, that's not really anything special, is that I, without being rude, would expect her to say thank you for me taking the time to give that advice. But then she said, and thank you for being such a positive role model for women in pre-hospital care. And that was the bit that becomes gratitude. So gratitude is a feeling that occurs in interpersonal exchanges when one person acknowledges receiving a valuable benefit from another with the perception that the personal benefit was not intentionally sought after, deserved or earned, but simply because of the good intentions of another person. So that fits the example that I just gave. There was no need for her to say that. It wasn't relevant to what we were doing. She wasn't trying to win anything back by saying that, but it actually meant a lot to me, and it motivated and inspired me to continue what I'm doing. Let me give you a different example. So I'm an A&E consultant, and I go in at 8 in the morning and I'm going to do the handover with my night team, and we're going to go through a list of patients who are in A&E and uh, work out what the plans are for people who haven't already got plans. And then at the end of 15 minutes, we're going to close, and I'm going to say thank you to the night team for working so hard and obviously sleep well. Is that gratitude? So I'm saying thank you. Is it authentic? Is it just a habit? Is it a social nicety? It's not quite the same. So gratitude is a deeper sense of appreciation. So these are some of the components of how you are great at being grateful. So it's spontaneous and unexpected. There is no obligation. It is undeserved merit. It's personal and specific, so it's individualised. It's perceived as genuine and sincere, and that's actually really important, the fact that it comes across as being authentic. And it's using a language valued by the recipient. So if you'd had that email from somebody, it wouldn't mean anything to you. But obviously, directed at me, that's really, really, that's really important. So let's imagine that earlier on this morning, one of the lectures really resonated with you. And it really, you really thought, gosh, no, well, I'm going to change my practice as a result of this. And I want to let the presenter know. So what are the various ways that you could do that? First of all, you could wait for your feedback form to come through and you could give them the top score and you could give them lots of lovely comments. But that's not really personal and it's not really unexpected, is it? So perhaps that's not really a great way of showing gratitude. You could go onto Twitter and you could put their Twitter handle in. You could do a nice photograph of them stood at the lectern and their slide behind them. And you could say, thank you for a fab talk. But sometimes those thank yous lack authenticity. 
So perhaps it looks slightly more like self-promotion rather than genuinely you know, feeding back that something was quite wonderful. You could send the person an email, so you could find out their email address and email them how you felt quite inspired by the lecture, but what it was about it that resonated with you. Or, in the break, you could go up to them and say, hi, just wanted to um, just say thank you, it was a great talk, and this was the bit that you know, was great, and I'm going to go forward and change my practice as a result. So have a think. When you're saying thank you, are you saying thank you? Are you giving gratitude? So that's really about the workplace aspects of gratitude. And now I want you just to reflect on personal recognition of gratitude. Because we live in a consumerist society where we are encouraged to focus on what we lack rather than what we actually have. And there's a bit of a concept that, you know, we are looking for happiness which is large and looming on the horizon and we're going to try and work our way up to reaching that happiness when perhaps actually it's a series of little joys that we have in our life every day. So it's the smile of a loved one, it's a brilliant gin and tonic at the end of a day, it's watching your child learn to ride the bike for the first time. They're the sorts of things perhaps that resonate with us better. <coughs> Excuse me. So if you look to bereavement counselling, there's quite a lot of interesting lessons learned here. So stick with me on this. Um, so imagine an older lady has lost her husband. They've been married for 50 years, and she's now coming to terms with a new life without him. And she decides to go for bereavement counselling to get over this. So they explore the losses that she sustained and how she's feeling and, you know, what's going on. And that's hard, but she's acknowledging them. And then the counsellor will ask her, well, what have you gained? And she'll go... Hang on a minute, my husband's just died, don't be ridiculous. And then they'll explore that actually there have been some gains in this situation. So it might be something like she used to love playing tennis, but her husband hated it, so she never went. And now, now her husband's died, she's actually joined the tennis club, she's getting fitter, she's making new friends, and actually some of those friends have been in the same situation as her and she's getting through it, so actually that's very positive. It might be that towards the end of... His illness, she was his main carer and she devoted all of her time looking after him and wasn't able to spend as much time with the rest of the family as she would have hoped. And now she gets to spend lots of time with her grandchildren and is heavily involved in her life and this brings her joy. So she was going, acknowledging the losses, but now exploring the gains. And this is all about changing mindsets. So let's imagine that you've made a mistake at work and all of you will make a mistake at work. Don't tell me that you haven't already made a mistake at work. If you say that, it means that you probably don't know that you've done it. Um, and there is a, a risk that you will just look at the, the fact of that you are a failure and you are ashamed of making that mistake. And that needs to be acknowledged. But then you also need to think about the gains. Let's take some lessons from bereavement counselling. So what are the gains in this situation? Like, how can there be any gains? Well, the gain is that from this experience... This is going to lead you to be a better doctor and provide better patient care. And it depends on what's happened, but I, undoubtedly that will happen and you'll acknowledge that as well and that will help you to move on. So we've all had a really rubbish day at work and you're driving home and it's a nightmare. And actually for those of you who have longer commutes, it's rubbish, but this is good for you because by the end of your commute you've probably debriefed yourself and you've chilled out a bit and as you walk through the front door, you're on good form. Those of us who have shorter commutes maybe are still a bit uptight when we get in. But when you're on that journey home, no matter how you're getting home, I would urge you to think of three things that went well during your day. And some days you might really struggle. You might really be scraping the barrel. But I did this the other day, so it could have been um, that actually somebody came up to me, a colleague who I don't know that well, and gave me a coffee shop coffee cappuccino chocolate sprinkles and um, said you look like you needed a coffee and um, you look like you were having a bit of a bad day so I just bought you a coffee and that was lovely and that was great and I did really need a coffee so that was a really good thing that happened that day. It might be that I had to refer a patient to the notorious difficult specialty surgical consultant. Notorious. And I primed myself but I was very eloquent and I got my point across and I didn't argue at all. He accepted the patient, and we were able to provide excellent patient care. 
And you know what? It might be that I got to leave work on time. So although it was a horrendous day, I still got to leave at four o'clock. And I'm going home now, going to have a nice evening, and I'm actually off tomorrow. So that's really good. So really important to reframe your thoughts. So you've gone from a complaining mindset into a best outcomes mindset. And think about how easy that is to do. You can be driving home, you've got the music on, and you're just thinking about it. That's all you have to do. It's a quick win situation. For those of you who've got children, a really useful thing to do is to, as you're tucking your child into bed at night, ask them, tell me one great thing that happened today. They will come out with some really amusing things. So it's worth it for that, if nothing else. But also, it means they're thinking about something positive as they're going to sleep, especially if it's a child that's worrying about something else. So it can be really useful. So you might be listening to this going, what a load of tosh, not interested in that sort of happy clappy sort of stuff. Or you might say, do you know what? It doesn't actually require any effort. I might have a go at this, I might have a think about it. So here's some sorts of things you could do. So every day record one thing that you're grateful for. And I would recommend that you record it. So you can't just think about it in your head. You probably need to write it down somewhere. So on a post-it note, in a notebook, or on the notes page of your phone. Because you kind of need to see them accumulating to go, actually, that's pretty cool. Um, the second point, in the next week, try and find an opportunity to show heartfelt gratitude. And remember what those five components were. Making sure it's spontaneous, making sure it's personal, making sure that it's authentic, and making sure it's in the right language. And in the next month, see if you can write a thank you letter. So write a letter to somebody that you really are grateful for what they've done, and again, using the same approach. So that's all from me. Hopefully I've given you a little insight into how an attitude to gratitude might be useful. And I'm going to say thank you to you for listening, and I'll be happy to take any questions at the very end of the session. Thank you. I was going to say thank you, but I don't thank feel you. like that. <laughs> um, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Anne Harvey. Uh, Anne's been a consultant at the Royal Cornwall Hospital for some time, I'm going to say. Um, she's got lots of specialist interests in anaesthesia, um, uh, in her anaesthetic practice, I should say, but has got a special interest in coaching and mentoring. Anne's going to be talking to us about mindfulness and resilience building. Thank you. You just have to hold on a second while we deal with the technology. Apologies, but there we go. If we're lucky, we'll get some slides. Great. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you today about mindfulness and resilience. These are this is your sprouts lecture. Love them or hate them, you know you should. Um, I'm elected board member and chair of the IRC, which is how I'm here, and I am a co-founder of the Cornwall Coaching <laughs> Hub and RCHT lead for coaching and mentoring uh, with the heavy um, uh, pressure on, on the coaching, really, uh, rather than mentoring. Um, and so, mindfulness. What is mindfulness? Well, it's one of those things that means lots of different things to different people. <coughs> So it's a whole scale of things, isn't it? Some people use it to mean uh, not careless, so being mindful about how you speak, how, what, how you are, how you interact, um, right through to the other end of the scale, which is the, the sort of Buddhist enlightenment disappear in a flash of light sort of um, part of mindfulness, um, and somewhere in between. So I'm not a great expert in mindfulness, uh, where I use it is in the coaching area, and also for training, te um, tra teaching trainees sort of techniques and strategies. So it's what you might call mini mindfulness. So I will be, you know, the usual lives we all have, rushing around, theatres, patients, surgeons, emails, WhatsApp, um, all the sort of different responsibilities. Those were just some of the things I do. Um, and so my life is pretty hectic, and then somebody wants to come for a coaching session or a mentoring session. So it's how do I move from that to that? Um, so mini mindfulness is one of the useful things coaches often use to help them get there, to develop that presence, to be really there, to listen really hard to what's going on for, for that person in that session. 
And I can talk to you all about the physiology and the pharmacology and the neurotransmitters and the pathways and the psychology and all the benefits, but you know those and you can intuit them. If, if you don't know them, you can read the research for yourself. So today we're going to do a little bit of experiential learning. Uh, for those of you who do not want to participate, I respect your right not to because it isn't for everybody. Uh, but for those of you who'd like to give it a go, we're going to just do a little exercise. It doesn't take very long, um, so uh, we can revert to the traditional uh, method of teaching in, in a moment. Um, but this is a, a little exercise taught to me by the great Monica Ross. I don't have her beautiful Irish accent, so you're going to have to go with mine. Um, and I would also name check Damien Wonfor, who introduced me to Monica Ross, and he's great for all things mindfulness, if it is your thing. Um, so we're going to, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes if you're comfortable with that. If not, just sit there with your eyes open and start to take those nice, slow, deep breaths of mindfulness. Nice, slow, deep breaths. Focus on your breathing. In and out, focusing on your breathing. And as you're breathing, you're noticing how you're sitting, how your back is against the chair, how your legs are, your feet against the floor, where your arms are sitting, laying against you. And you're focusing on your breathing, in and out. And you're noticing. And as you notice, you notice your core. And you travel to the center of your core, and you notice it is stable and strong and resilient. And you notice your heart. And your heart is like the ocean. It is deep. And it contains life and energy. And it's calm at the depths and is even at the surface. And you notice your mind, and your mind is like the night sky. It is vast and still and full of possibilities. It has all the resources and the answers twinkling like twinkling stars. And you focus on your breathing, and you breathe in, and you breathe out, and you are connected to the center. And you have the power of confidence. And now I'm going to break your concentration and ask you to come back into the room, but remember where that place was. Remember that feeling, remember where it is, and as you practice this exercise, that distance between where you are in your busy life and that center becomes shorter and you're able to access it more quickly, okay? And lots and lots of very famous and very successful uh, professionals um, in, in all aspects of life practice mindfulness um, and do it, do it very well. And in fact, um, Professor Michael West was name-checked a few times this morning, and uh, he is a great practitioner, very much the, that end of the scale of mindfulness, uh, which he uses in his leadership, um, his compassionate leadership. Okay, so we've already heard about um, gratitude and how that is part of building resilience, and this is how mindfulness can build resilience. It can build your strength, it can center you, um, and you connect, connect to your core. But resilience, again, is one of those words. It means a lot of different things to different people. And some people have antibodies to the words, don't they? Because resilience can be weaponized. Um, so, you know, it's because you're not resilient enough. And there's lots of different definitions. I put a few up there, and you probably have your own as to what it means to you. Um, one of those things is grit. Uh, I just put up this coaching cartoon because I like the bottom phrase there. When you've exhausted all possibilities, remember you haven't, which is a very coaching approach. And the re reason resilience is important is because we all live in the VUCA world. Are you familiar with VUCA? It's a terminology from the um, 70s, I think, the, the American military. 
Um, we live in a volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous world with the speed of change going faster and faster. And what we crave are the four S's. Or do we really? I don't know. I kind of like the VUCA thing. But it's how you manage that, isn't it? And manage yourself in that culture and climate. This is a very old curve from a very long time ago. Um, but it kind of describes very beautifully that, that place of optimal performance, which is a, a lot of what we focus on in, in coaching is around performance. But I would draw your attention to the line between eustress and distress, um, because that's the line you need to know. And you need to know where that is for you. And you need to manage yourself around that line. Because things go up and down, um, things happen, life happens, things you can control, but an awful lot you can't control. So you're bumping along underneath your maximum performance. So I would say to you, mind the gap. Know what, where you are on that graph. Know what makes you go up and down, closer and closer to that line, and be able to control that. This is from Yossi Eves and Elaine Cox's book about coaching, and it's just a graph to show you what happens when, when a bad event occurs. Um, it's an external event, and it happens to us all, doesn't it, quite regularly? Some are serious, some not so much. Um, and you internalize, you come down, and you internalize that event. And it's about how you bounce back up in resilience. So as a coach or mentor, you would be managing that person, helping that person work through that curve so the dip is as low as possible, the, the climb up is, is as, as quick as possible back to where they were before. But bearing in mind when you're dealing with resilience, you know, people go down and down. So it's a, sometimes a very long way to come up. How do you measure resilience? How do you know what your level of resilience is? Um, so there are lots of different tools you can use in the psychology world. Uh, this is the Nicholson McBride one, for example, it looks at all different aspects of, of your personality and your abilities. Um, it asks you lots of questions that you answer, a little survey, you score yourself, because after all, it is all about you, even though they tell you it's not, it is all about you. Um, so you, you give yourself a score, and then it interprets the score for you. But like all these things we do in coaching and mentoring, these little tools and techniques we use, it's where you are now, where you want to be, and how are you going to get there. Or you can use this over a trend and look at the score as it changes, depending what goes on in your life. If you've just had a fabulous two-week holiday, you'll probably be scoring highly. If you've had a really stressful week of nights, you'll probably be scoring quite low. What happens in your life to affect, affect your scores? And what can you do about building your resilience. So for those of you who, who the mindfulness didn't, didn't click with, I've got a number of different examples of structures that you can use if you're particularly, you like a structure. After all, we are anaesthetists. Um, so we've heard a little bit about appreciative inquiry through the day, um, and that's partly uh, the, the gratitude. It's, it's all about the appreciative inquiry and the positive psychology. Um, for those of you who want to know more, I recommend you, you read up. Um, and you may also uh, be familiar with the Learn from Excellence as well, the great is these kind of positive psychology uh, techniques that we can use. If I ask you to elicit your strengths, do you know what they are? Now, I expect if I gave you a SWOT, you're familiar with that, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunity, threats. Um, if I gave you the SWOT, you would probably spend an awful lot of time on the right-hand side, and you would write reams, and you would be able to tell me everything you can't do or that you're not good at, because that is our culture, that is our life. We focus on the negative. From the minute you walk into school, it's not about the, the maths test that you got one wrong. It's, about, it's, a, it's not about the nine, it's the one you got wrong. So we are trained that way. We are trained. It's our clinical culture. What is wrong with the patient? What have you noticed that's wrong with the situation, the systems? Uh, so we do focus on what's wrong. Um, but if, if you can focus on what you do well, if you can focus and know yourself... Yesterday there was um, a talk and somebody was... Uh, at the end there was a panel of questions and somebody asked a question about oh, you're all busy people and you do loads of things. How do you manage your work-life balance? 
And that's all about loving your work, loving what you do, because then it's not work. Um, so it's about knowing your strengths and working with those, finding what you're good at and doing that and building on it. Uh, we, and, and I won't go through reframing and use of language because um, we've already heard a little bit about that in the gratitude, how you reframe thoughts and conversations. Uh, but use your coach, use your mentor for challenge in a safe environment. That's a safe conversation for you to explore what you need to do to build your resilience. Um, again, looking after yourself, we've heard a lot about that. Developing your connections, whatever that means for you. Um, and focusing on what brings you joy. In the last lecture, we heard a little bit about that. Develop your emotional intelligence so you know again more about yourself. And avoid your negative thinking. These are habits of mind. We pick them up, we learn, we copy, we act in a way that's expected of us in a particular role. Um, and it generates negative thinking. And that is just a habit you've learned. So if you're spiraling down, if you're hyper self-critical, it's about bringing yourself back out of it. Use your coach or mentor to challenge those negative thoughts about yourself. That little voice inside that says it's not for you. Um, people like me don't. Or I can't, they can. That person's better. Um, and so on. Just think about what you can do. What are your strengths? What are your values as an individual? And know your limits. Mind the gap. Here's another, um, another structure, the managing structure. So looking at a range of aspects, like we talked about at the lunch, that wheel of life, looking at different aspects of your life to explore what you need to do to build your resilience. What's kind of weakening you? What's worrying you? What's uh, ticking away uh, that needs attention? But remember, it, you are within a department, you are within a group of people, they might be a team, they might just be a group of people, um, you are part of an organization. So the organization, the department, what is the resilience like in that department? Uh, and this is a little um, structure from the NHS safeguarding, but I, I borrowed it because it's got nice little boxes there. What is your staff engagement like? What is the decision-making process? Um, what are the resources that are available? How much silo working is there? And how much versus how much connectivity? So it's really important if you think about your own resilience, but also within the group, within the culture. And then this is another structure for dealing with that little internal voice. Okay, deal with your inner dialogue. Know what that voice is saying. Don't, don't dismiss it. Don't discount it. Just like you wouldn't discount somebody who's talking to you. You know, you listen to them, um, listen to that voice, but control it. And that leads into the sort of self-esteem and self-confidence. And we talked a lot about having insight. Um, just in case you didn't know, the little insight is actually a place in St. Ives just down the road from, from me. Um, and then this final little structure to, to introduce you to, the, hand, the way you handle setbacks. So what structure do you have for handling your setbacks? What have you organized for yourself? How do you run through um, to, to deal with what happens because things happen? You know, do you have positive adaptive behaviors or negative? So that's a little sort of run through, a little brief introduction to some mindfulness, um, how that can feed into resilience, and some of the structures and ways that you can use to build your resilience. Um, it's a massive topic. It's something I could go on for days about, uh, but I won't. I will stop there. I would like to just chuck in an advert for our course intro, if anyone's interested in the Safe PEDS course. Yesterday, we had a fantastic and amazing and really scary talk about PEDS transfer, didn't we? So if you're not confident with your general PEDS, your PED anesthesia and dealing with emergencies, getting called down to to the ED department. We're running a course and it's fantastic. I did this course in London and, uh, and it's really, really good. I feel very confident now. Okay. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Anne. Um, so our next speaker is Dr Nancy Redfern. Uh, Nancy is a consultant anaesthetist in Newcastle. She's been involved with the association for years and is currently vice president of the association. She's an enthusiast for mentoring and as such is going to be talking to us about mentoring. So thank you very much and it's a great pleasure and honour uh, to come and talk about something that, as, as uh, Jackie says, I'm really enthusiastic about. Um, I discovered mentoring about 25 years ago. Um, I was the Associate Dean for uh, Women in Medicine and uh, people working what was then called flexibly, but is now less than full time. And it's been the thing that I think I have found the most useful of all the courses or programmes or bits of learning that I've done um, throughout my career. So, uh, you know, that's why I'm an enthusiast. I'm not very good at these things, wish me luck. So what I'm going to do is talk about just a few sentences on what it is, uh, what people use it for, who uses it, when, just introduce one framework, which I personally find very helpful, and then describe a little bit about what we're um, very much in development, but trying to set up at the association. So here are some definitions. And it's a funny old thing, reading a definition. Of course, we like definitions, and I see that all three of us have given them. Um, but there's a, it, the business is around putting that definition into action. So I really like this, which comes from Mary Connor and Julia Pecora, who um, started running the Association of Anaesthetist Mentoring course. The first thing they say, and I think a very, a very quick description of what's going on, is it's a learning relationship. So when I'm mentoring, as I do, um, a newly appointed um, consultant in, in uh, my hospital, um, a respiratory physician, I learn as much or more about the world of their world of work as ever that person learns. The thing with a mentor is the idea is that the individual takes charge of their own development. You're kind of there to help them to, to understand and release their full potential and to achieve what they want. So I'm not there as the sort of advisor. I'm not there trying to help them fit into the department better. I'm there to help them with their sets of skills and knowledge to achieve the maximum and what they want from their world. This come, the next definition comes from the two Davids, David Meginson and David Clutterbuck, who set up the European Coaching and Mentoring Council. And I spoke there about 12 or 13 years ago, um, following an MP called Paul Boite. It was one of those moments when you think, what am I doing on stage? Anyway, he points out, the, 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 the two Davids point out this is offline, by which they mean your educational supervisor, your clinical director should not also be your mentor. If you do that, you know, you have to take your hat off and say, I'm this now or I'm that now. Um, the other thing that they point out, which I think is really important, is that it's not something we need all the time. It's at a, a point of transition. And they're talking about transitions in knowledge. So when you've passed an exam and you're moving on to the next bit and thinking about, you know, I've passed the final FRCA, what actually do I want my career to look like? To, um, uh, oops, a change in, in work or in thinking. So it's at moments when you're just on the cusp and thinking, oh, I might have an opportunity here. What can I do that's going to make the best of this? We all have conversations at work. And I think what I hadn't realised before I, I came across mentoring was that there is a whole topic area, which Anne knows lots about, which is around what are those, what is a quality conversation? Why am I having this conversation? So there are lots of things in the literature and that people who aren't involved in mentoring think might be mentoring, but actually aren't. So it's not patronage. 
I was at the um, Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh you know, on the last week, and there was a person there saying what she does is she does absolutely everything the boss tells her to do, and in exchange, he makes sure she's all right and her career moves forward. Well, that's about her following in his shoes. It's not about what sort of person she's going to be. And it's about the patron being more senior, more wise, more knowledgeable, better connected, and helping that person move forward. So it's not that. People will often come, and I'm sure Anne gets this as well, people come and ask for advice. Because it's a natural way of, of working in the world. But actually... In advice, and we had a lovely description of the advice when you're pregnant as a, a femme consultant, what the person does is they impart a bit of knowledge, the information that they know, and they will sometimes add an opinion. But actually, you know, my advice to you is no use, I'll never be you. What you want is to unpick what that advice might be and think about what of that what what does it mean to, to me? So it's not advice giving. It's not counselling and therapy. Uh, therapy. You know, people who do counselling, they kind of review you. Ha they help you review your past to understand the, your pre the present. Um, it's much more complex, long-term, in-depth. They will ask you all sorts of questions that you possibly don't want to touch on. So that the counsellor is a very expert person in the relationship, but, but they're bringing an expertise on when to push you in what direction. So a, a mentor doesn't have that level of skills. Sometimes it might be a bit of coaching. But we've just heard Anne, who's a really, really good coach. And you can see how she, she's using, she's a sort of, she's much more expert. She's using frameworks and introducing models and knows lots about all of these different topics. Sometimes, and I've had this, you get a short, structured, scheduled set of, uh, a bit of coaching, which is around... I mean, I w when I was at the deanery, I was coached about chairing meetings because everybody was. And it was about developing skills and qualities in that area. So the coach is a trained expert and knows lots of ways you can do things. They may not be as good as you at doing it. They may be, you know, like um, sports coaches, are not, they're not going to win the Olympics. But they're a trained expert in getting the best out of people. So sometimes I think it's a bit like coaching, but it doesn't bring that level of expertise. So mentoring is just about the here and now. It's about the present. It's, it's about a thoughtful, insightful person having a conversation where the mentee is the expert. And look at this. The GMC says we should use this sort of thing. And if you work in Cornwall and you can have the more expert um, stuff from Anne, that's great. But for the rest of us, um, whenever you change roles throughout your career. So when I became vice president, one of my uh, colleagues at work, I had a, a, a few mentoring sessions and I, I carried on doing that. So what do people use it for? Well, this is a study that um, Alice and Stephen and um, Jane Stewart and, and others of us have done. And uh, we won, a thing called the Joan Dawkins Award, which was £50,000 from the, the BMA. And what we've looked at is people who have trained as mentors and then looking at the work they're doing with their mentees for the first two years and asking the question, what sort of things do people talk about? And actually, the underpinning thing that we've found out is that the mentoring is the vehicle whereby people work to improve their own well-being. So a lot of people will come and talk, and their, their first in is around career development, a lot about workload, work-life balance, relationships with colleagues, that's a big topic among uh, consultants, stress, 
taking an opportunity. What is this an opportunity? Should I do this? Morale, that, you know, low morale, or trying to improve it in the department, change management. So self-confidence, engagement, the odd person who's been bullied or harassed and having a horrible time. So lots and lots of different topics where people come and the nature of the conversation is just around, well, what do I want to, what's going on? What, what is, what's underpinning all this? So who uses it and when? Well, where I am in Newcastle, we've got as well as doctors, we've got nurses and midwives and some allied health professionals um, and st some uh, students and managers, um, some of whom are trained mentors, but uh, a lot of people who use this um, for, th for themselves. And really, anyone who has a dilemma or an opportunity, but who is strategic about thinking through what they want and isn't just going to ask for a spot of advice, but is going to try and understand really what's going on and achieve what they can from the situation they find themselves in. So this came from a focus group we did when we'd done 11 courses in a particular area of the UK. And what people said was they were using two things, actually. They were using mentoring and they found that they were working with colleagues, they were using it in, in the department, they were using it to support people in difficulty, but they were using the mentoring skills as well. And that when they were managing a patient who had a conflict or a complaint, or um, there was a change management thing, they were using the frameworks and the skills and getting a lot from that too. And this comes from some work Jolly and Oxley did um, about improving our working lives, which was several years ago, but I think still stands. People felt when they had used mentoring and when they were in the network of people for whom this was a normal sort of conversation, that they felt more job satisfaction and increased confidence. Their ability to solve or manage problems or unpick dilemmas became better and that they were more collegiate because they felt that their colleagues around them were doing this well. People talking about actually capitalising on some of the successes and taking on their personal and professional development and seeing a much broader picture and a few people who had been brave enough to deal with some pretty severe difficulties. So what on earth does a mentor do then? Well, like Anne has described in coaching, we do use a framework um, and different people use different frameworks, but I'm just going to introduce one so you get a little bit of a flavour. And that's Gerard Egan's skilled helper model. And when we were wondering about setting up um, a mentoring programme, um, we were advised that this might be really useful in the world of medicine and dentistry and what have you. Um, in, the, in the world of sort of coaching and business, the, the, there are models like GROW, which say you have to have a goal. Whereas Egan says, which I find very helpful, that one of the things we might have to start by doing is understanding what the current situation is. And for the last two years, the example I have been able to give very easily is Brexit. What the hell is going on? What does Europe think? What does the Conservative Party think? What do we think? What on earth is going on? And I'm sure we've all been in our clinical world of work in a sort of Brexitoid situation where there's going on and you just want to unpick well, what is happening now? Sometimes we know what's going on. And the thing we don't do is think, well, actually, what do I need and want instead? What would good look like? So um, this Monday, I was running a, a thing in our hospital uh, for the senior, uh, oh, I don't know who they were, they were very important people, senior lead management people and, and consultants. And the, we feel we haven't got the well-being stuff right and that nurses are getting stuff and the secretarial people are getting it. It's just missing the, the, the medics. So we asked ourselves, well, okay then, what would good look like? 
when you come to work, when you're at work? What would a place that really took account of your well-being be doing? And it was an absolutely brilliant session because people were really thinking as wildly as possible about what would be going on. Sometimes you know what's going on, and you, the question you have is, how am I going to do it? So I was mentioning uh, last week at the British Association of Urological um, Surgeons, and there was a girl came in, and she'd got an ST3 post, and she had one thing that she desperately wanted to do. Uh, she'd done a PhD in it years ago and was you know, just absolutely driven to do that. And what she wanted to do was work out how to continue developing that, bit of, that, that special bit of her while getting the most from her training. I had another chap who came who was a, a clinical director, and he absolutely had a core value of collaborative inquiry and keeping things collegiate. But there was, uh, there was something going badly wrong where he felt that he was going to have to move out of that and start on a bit of command control. So how could he stay, how could he stay congruent to his core values but yet achieve what was needed. So those are the sort of how questions. When you get down to it, there's a bit more to it, and it's, um, this is the actual full model. So when we do mentor development programs, uh, it does take a little bit longer to learn. So actually in mentoring, as in coaching, and as in lots of things, it's a more complex thing. You have to have some core values of respect, empathy, and genuineness. You have to develop the skills of listening and, and questioning and exploring and engaging, broadening horizons, that sort of thing. You need a framework, and only with that, so all those three things, is it, are you going to actually have something that works. So just a couple of minutes on the sort of nascent scheme we have in the association. Schemes that work all have trained mentors. We've done quite a lot of that. There are quite a few people. Informed mentees. I kind of hope I might be doing a little bit of that now. But to be honest, if I'm going to inform people, we do a demo. Um, and it must be voluntary. So those places, you know, Royal College of Surgeons, we, we, we give them mentors, you know, and you don't train them. Oops. It's great when you have support from senior managers and, and leaders and, you, you know, ongoing mentor development and, and um, support is pretty important as well. So that's the map. Um, it's a bit in development, and there are places where the, there are probably more people than, um, than perhaps show on the map at the moment. And actually, there are some other mentoring schemes that are kind of a um, little, bit, little bit growing from ours and a little bit growing from other people. Um, this one is in, the, um, it's in Wessex, and I love, their, I love their picture of the brain. Um, and if you Google, if you look on the website, you, you can see an, a nice description of what it is. But what about informing mentees? It's, um, this, I, I've just read a paper from the, the Sweat Study Investigator Group, and uh, this uh, quote from one of the trainees, a mentor just listens to you ramble on, I guess, that's probably what a mentor is meant to be. Well, it isn't. You know, a mentor is going to get the right balance between support and challenge and help you to work out what's going on, what's really going on, what would good look like, what, what, what can you set yourself to do and be and think, how are you going to do things differently? They talk about if you're in a situation where you, you might not be given the right mentor, so this is about somebody who's thinking that it might be imposed, so that needs to be altered. And also it has to be accessible and available. And this person is also saying, um, in fact, these might be three different people, I can't really remember, um, that it's, it, it, unless it's there, it's kind of not going to work so well. So I hope that's been a little bit of a tour about mentoring. Thank you for listening.
Thank you, Nancy. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Chris Mowat. Uh, Chris is a consultant in anaesthetics and intensive care medicine uh, in Shrewsbury and Telford. He's also Foundation, uh, Foundation Doctor Training Program Director. He's got an interest in creating an environment for training and maintaining the well-being of his colleagues. He's going to be talking to us about the Telford Initiative. The Telford Project. It sounds a bit ominous, doesn't it? Let me uh, just... Uh, um, well, thank you for some really, really interesting talks um, and uh, you know, some themes which are very dear to my heart, um, which if... Uh, Caroline had mentioned to the house officer I was when we first met nearly 20 years ago, um, I would have reacted violently against. Um, it was all a bit too touchy-feely for me, and it would have made me uh, pretty uncomfortable. Um, the ideas of intelligent kindness, that kindness is a preserved um, capacity in all of us. Um, I've written it down on my hand. Uh, the ideas of authentic, positive feedback and learning from excellence. Um, the uh, idea that you need to really understand yourself and be able to have a chat with yourself and create space to do that. For some people, it's mindfulness. I've started the practice of transcendental meditation, which sounds groovy, but it's just a, you know, a, 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 uh, an easy way of, of, of achieving mindfulness, um, which the 21-year-old me would have laughed at. And also, you know, the idea that we need to look after each other. Um, I now have to use two hands to count the number of people I have worked with or uh, know that have either killed themselves or harmed themselves with too much drugs and alcohol. Um, and if I included the people I didn't know about, I would have to use my other limbs as well. So this is important. So uh, I, I'm not very good at this stuff, so where do uh, bad presenters start um, they go to Google Bad Presenter and they find a quote to make them look clever. So, uh, I think this is a good quote. This is how we treat our trainees in Shrewsbury, our foundation doctors. We want them to come back as consultants and they should be treated um, as colleagues, as consultant colleagues of the future. But Richard Branson isn't cool anymore because of his uh, healthcare ambitions. So... Uh, Snow White, uh, whistle while you work. The idea that, that work can be joyful, that you can have pleasure at work, um, and that, that is something that we, we can aspire to. Ha <laughs> ha, get lost. No one dies of yogapenia, resilience, mindfulness, workforce planning. We're, you know, we've got problems with people coming out of corridors in A&E. We've got... Um, uh, a hospital that doesn't work. We've not got enough junior doctors. Why resilience fix a system, man? Well, I'm going to say no, actually, that um, all of these things, uh, learning about um, how we protect each other as colleagues includes that, for sure, but it also includes a deeper understanding of how we work together and operate as colleagues. So get lost, Internet Cynic. So uh, I'm going to provide a little bit of context here about what we've done in Telford and the sort of wider well-being project. So we want to be in that top right-hand corner. We want people who are working well and feel good about themselves. Now, this is where Internet Cynic's argument falls down because there's a reason that Google, Deloitte & Touche, KPMG, big international employers use this stuff. There is a reason that the most successful program Google run is the Search Inside Yourself uh, Mindfulness program. Chade Meng Tang, you can read that in 20 minutes, half an hour, that book, brilliant. Highly recommend it. There's a reason that we do this. It's because we know that people who feel good about being at work and whose uh, value is recognised perform well. And that's what we want, because it's good for us, it's good for our organisation, and it's good for patients too. But you will hear people say, in my day, I got up before I went to work, and I worked for 27 hours a day, and uh, we never slept, and it was much better. Um, rubbish. It's much harder now. I never came in to see patients coming out of A&E. I never faced this kind of criticism in the national press. I was never hectored and pilloried um, by the newspapers. Uh, we're working in incredibly stressful times. 
So, what's unusual about us? Well, does anyone know who that chap at the bottom there is? Um, he's called Deming, uh, and he went to Japan after the Second World War, and uh, is famous for improving the, the, the work um, of the Toyota car factory, among others, improving Japanese industry after the war. And uh, the work that he created, the, the processes for quality improvement, building things up from the bottom, making sure everyone's valued, making sure everyone's voice is heard, those kind of quality improvement processes are employed at the Virginia Mason Institute, um, the safest hospital in the world, um, uh, who are paired with a number of trusts around the UK, uh, five of them, uh, including us. And they're transforming care methodologies about building things from the bottom up and understanding how uh, we work together have kind of fed into what we do. So as part of that, building from the bottom up, Foundation doctors are the eyes and ears of the hospital. We had a uh, brainstorming session, and we looked at this. We use this burnout prevention matrix as a tool just to frame that. So what can we do as individuals to reduce our stress and recharge our batteries? And what can we do as an organisation to help people reduce their stress, recharge their batteries, where are their problems? What are they perceiving as being the challenges? Because sometimes there's that sort of paternal, we impose solutions we think are going to work, when in actual fact our junior doctors, our eyes and ears on the shop floor, um, have a completely different idea of where things are broken. So we asked them, we did a, burn -up, we did a uh, couple of uh, brainstorming sessions, we sent out surveys and they told us what was wrong. And the main themes were agency. People know what's wrong, they can see it, but they're not given the power to fix it. And this is one of the great things about the Virginia Mason Institute and that transforming care methodology. We've now brought that to our trainees and we've, all, we've run sessions for them so that they have a better understanding of building high quality, good quality improvement projects based on their own idea, restoring that agency, giving them the power to make meaningful changes and they've done that with handovers and and various other things around the hospital and it's worked really positively teamwork necessarily shifts have changed the patterns of work have changed but firm structures have remained fairly static that old idea of the sort of boss at the top lancelot spratt you know barking at people um, and uh, people feel disconnected from the rest of their team they might not see them a lot they don't get that positive feedback we've talked about. They're not part of that team. And that is disorientating. Fatigue was a big problem. They're knackered. They're working really, really hard. They're not exception reporting. We've encouraged them to do that, and they've made real big changes because of that. But as we know, it's like turning around a tanker, uh, trying to make meaningful change in the NHS. It can be really difficult. Plus, as the world knows now, there's no cash. God bless him. Old Johnny Cash, rest in peace. So all of these things start with a story. So this young man here is Rule. Um, Rule is a... Uh, it's not going to play, is it? Oh, yeah, there we go. Uh, so this is Rule. Um, Rule is an F1, and he came from Singapore. Um, he came fairly late notice to fill a slot that we needed him to fill. He's a lovely chap. Calm, courteous, very kind. And uh, he said, oh, I don't, I don't mean to trouble you. I'm, I'm really sorry, but, but the, the house I'm living in is not very good. I went, what do you mean it's not very good? We put him up in Telford in one of our doctor's accommodation. I never go to the doctor's accommodation. Well, there's paint peeling off the ceiling and the shower's never hot and I have to go for a shower um, in the hospital and the fridge is full of mould. And he was right. We went and had a look. And it was disgusting. Uh, it, it was embarrassing. Paint peeling off the floor. That kitchen's incredibly tidy, actually. But it was, you wouldn't want to live there. And you certainly wouldn't want to pay £600 a month to live there, which is what we were charging. So we sat down and we came up with a, a mission statement, myself and the Director of Medical Education, because we were pretty peed off about this. And we said, we want free, high-quality accommodation for our FY1s. Bold, uh, but um, we want to attract doctors in. We want to make them valued. 
and our accommodation sucked. It's absolutely disgraceful. But there's no cash. So we started to think a bit widely about what you know, we could do. Now, the NHS to me is, the beauty of it is that it matters to me what your health is like, as it matters to you what my health is like. We're all in it together. It's a community enterprise. This is Telford Hospital in the middle there. And you can see the community around it. They're embedded in the community. And I don't know about you, but you know, we're reconfiguring services here. And the tension between community leaders and the hospital is palpable. Lots of politics at play. People very unhappy about services being moved around. And local politicians chipping in um, to what they thought was wrong. What could we do? We've got no money. Perhaps we could approach partners in the community. Um, I went to meet the head of the council, Sean Davis, and uh, we talked about an NHS DIY SOS. Uh, a bold idea, but um, we thought they might be able to help. And they did. So we assembled a crack team. Hello. Jenny, our Director of Medical Education. Julia, our director, who's clearly got a very, very old phone. Sean, the leader of the uh, Telford and Reeking Council, who didn't want to share a video. Darren and Dave, the estates uh, legends. And, of course, myself. <laughs> and we had regular meetings where we sat down and we worked through what we were going to do. They couldn't have been more helpful. They were generating time and money and help for us. So we sat down. There was probably 15 of us in a room every Friday morning, and we made a plan to follow a process. Start a plan. Have a plan. Start with the executives. You've got to start at the top. You've got to get someone big like Julia or Deborah Meaden. You've got to get them involved. <laughs> if you want to communicate these stories, align them with trust values, because that's an easier story to sell, and use clarity, conviction. Consider the needs of all of the stakeholders. What would the trust get from this? Well, they'll get a useful, uh, well-resourced, happy workforce, which is great. Pay attention to the process. Make sure that you're keeping an eye on it. Make sure that you're over it. You're going to get resistance. Bat it away. Deal with it. Be positive. Celebrate early wins by showing people what you're doing so that they understand and sustain that dialogue so that your community partners know what you're doing. Be clear what success is, what you're looking for, what you're aiming to achieve. There's lots of stuff we can do, and it's, not, it's an untapped resource. Community partners bringing to bear the power of your community on your hospital is an almost unstoppable force, because everybody you speak to has got a story about their local hospital, their grand, their mum, their dad. They care. They really care. Third-party organisations, we have Macmillan nurses, but there are loads of charities out there who are keen to help us. They've got expertise, they've got contacts, and they know the shortcuts. This would have cost us 300,000 quid if we'd used NHS-only contractors. It ended up costing 75 grand. What is there to lose? Be creative. Acknowledge that there are only a limited number of things you can care about. So if people are giving you criticism, but you know that you're on target and you're doing a good, kind thing, crack on and ignore the criticism. Tell a story. It's powerful. It helps people understand what's going on. So we now have two, then four, then six houses refurbished to very high standards for our junior doctors. They're going to be free. Our F1s are living free in our accommodation next year. In each house, the mess in the last hospital I worked at was named after a doctor who died on the way home. They're going to have a room in each house for somebody to sleep after night shifts, and they're going to have a free breakfast to show that we care about our staff. So it's done all that, and it's shown our colleagues that well-being is important and that we value them. It's led on to other stuff. We've now got a high-quality mess that was, used to be outside of the hospital, a bit dingy. It's now inside of the hospital. We've now got food, 
hot food 24 hours a day, or we will have um, very shortly, which we didn't have before. It's all on the back of this, and all helped by community partners. This is young JD at the bottom here. Whoops, where's he gone? There he is. JD was uh, killed in a motocross accident. He died. He needed cardiac massage and resuscitation uh, and came to our A&E and survived. And uh, he's back at school and he's absolutely fine. And his mum and dad donated some uh, roller blinds, which, without which we wouldn't have been able to do our new mess. So that's it. For what it's worth, here are my kind of bits on well-being. And I think it chimes in with everything that's been said today. Be able to have an honest chat with yourself. Acknowledge that your well-being needs to be actively managed. It's an active process. Have a routine. Come home from work. I get changed. Have a shower. Wallop. That's it. That's work done. No work emails. Finished. Um, then be prepared to smash that routine and occasionally do stuff you wouldn't normally do and steal time. It feels much more valuable if you've done something you wouldn't normally do. Find something you love. For me, that is middle-aged, midlife dad rock and uh, uh, the release of an album which is never to be heard by anybody apart from uh, people we force it on. Um, but that's something that brings me joy and something I actively make time for, uh, even when it's difficult. Thank you very much.